went. And it's good to see we have a little more people today. And you're feeling better? Yes. Yeah, Lydia, good. Yeah. Just scary. It's over. It's yeah. over. Are there any concerns for prayer we'd like to lift up before the congregation at this time? Janet. Tim and Vivian Stanley who lost her son. Prayers for healing. For the military brothers and sisters who came home to see their families and friends. Their parents. Homeless and poor have some food and shelter time. Continue prayers for my mom. keep these people in our prayers during our prayer time together. And as we begin, we begin with a reading taken from Psalm 25, the Psalm of David. To thee, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in thee I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Yea, let none that wait for thee be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth, and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. For thee I wait all the day long. Be mindful of thy mercy, O Lord, and of thy steadfast love, for they have been from old. For whenever not the sins of my youth or my transgressions, according to thy steadfast love, remember me for thy goodness' sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his way, in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. We gather here today, dear Lord, knowing that we have fallen short so many ways, times, and places. Yet you are the God of second and third chances who continues to look beyond our faults, to love us for who we are and who we can be. So we gather here today, bless us that we may do honor and glory to this great patience, this great unconditional love you have for us, that we may at some point enter your heavenly kingdom, cleansed, whole, and at peace. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Would you please join with me in our unison prayer of invocation? O blessed Lord, most glorious, we join with the heavenly court, the angels and the archangels, in giving praise to your glory and power. Before you who can stand, your voice filled with might is heard on the seas and echoes over the ocean. It makes the lightning flash, the mountains to shake, and the desert to tremble. Yet you are kind and compassionate to those who love you and 
and seek to follow your commandments. Be with us in this hour to lead us in your truth, for we long to know your ways and be guided by your spirit. Direct us into that realm where your purposes govern our hearts and our minds, that we might grow in the likeness of Jesus and learn to live in ways that are pleasing to you. We wait for you now, eager to respond to your call. This we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jonathan will play for us our hymn of adoration, hymn number 507, Come All Christians Be Committed.
that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Father, we take great pride and great pleasure in the fact that you have loved us enough that no matter how far we have fallen, what we have done or what we have left undone, you are always there to guide us, direct us, and lead us along a new path. This all begins with Jesus, for it is through him that we are granted eternal life, the forgiveness of our sins and made whole and at peace. Dear and gracious Lord, help us to be grateful for this gift. Amen. You please stand and join with me in our glory.
life and conqueror of death, we bring before you these gifts. They are but our tithes and our offerings, symbols of our life and of our labor. And we ask that you take them and use them, and take us and use us for the spreading of your gospel and the work of your church, both here and throughout the world. This we pray in Jesus' most holy name. Please be seated. And as you remain seated, would you join with me in our call to prayer? <laughs> God, we have gathered here as your people, summoned by you, called to this, con to this sanctuary to be the people you would want us to be, and not as we are sometimes. We thank you for your patience and your guidance throughout the course of our lives. And we raise our voices in prayer for those that are in need. We pray especially for Janet's daughter-in-law, who has had a heart attack, for the friends of Mary and Rollicott, prayers of healing. For Tim, prayers of healing, continued prayers for the families that have lost loved ones during this past month and during the last few months. Especially pray for Renny and his family this time, asking for your comfort upon them. We pray for Lori, who is going in for some medical treatments this coming week, asking for your blessing to be upon her. We pray for David, prayers of healing. We pray for all those mentioned and those not, for those remembered and those not. And you know who they are, Heavenly Father. We pray for ourselves, asking for your guidance in our lives and our, in a direction that we may come to you and not turn to ourselves. We pray, dear Lord, for all that are in need in some way, shape, or form. Hear these prayers and the prayer that Jesus taught the faithful when he said, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our second hymn this morning is Teach Me Your Way, O Lord, hymn number 472. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. <clears throat> when the bow is in the clouds, I will look upon it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature on, 
of all flesh that is upon the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Our second reading comes from the first letter of Peter, chapter 3, verses 18 through 22, and it's located on page 1060 of your Pew Bibles. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as the removal of dirt from the, from the body, but as an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 through 15, and that's located on page 867 of your two Bible. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and he was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens open and a spirit descending upon him like a dove. And a voice came from the heaven, from heaven, Thou art my beloved Son, with thee I am well pleased. The spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, and believe in the gospel. May God bless these readings, and bless our understanding of them. Always to his glory. Amen. Let us be in the spirit of prayer at this time. Lord Jesus, we walk with you during these 40 days of Lent, confronting some very difficult realities. If it were not for you telling us, we would avoid the truth about ourselves. We have good intentions. We sincerely mean to do what is right, but we fail to live as we intend. We want to be courageous and faithful, but often, too often in the face of trial and turmoil when life is cruel and our faith is called into question much to our great shame we falter hidden deep within the recesses of each of us is a treasure trove of desires evil intentions and hurtful thoughts father the only way we dare to walk this path during lent this path of honesty and confession is from the knowledge that you will be with us we thank you that you have not left us to our own desires, devices, and sinful intents. Rather, you came to us, stood in solidarity with us, and were tempted and suffered as we are tempted, and we must suffer. All this you did out of love for us and for our salvation. We gather to worship this day, and we walk this truthful Lenten way only because you walk with us. Praise and thanks be to you, O God. Grant us the aid of your Spirit, and direct our thoughts away from these earthly things and upon things heavenly, as we meditate upon your word. Remove from us all distraction, and help us to open our hearts and our minds, our souls and our spirits, that we may better understand that way, that truth, and that life which are in Christ, and always to live in the Holy Spirit, revealed and given to him. Bless this sermon to his glory, for it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Somewhere outside the city of Jerusalem, 
A man stands upon the shores of the Jordan River with a throng of others waiting to be baptized. He, like those from the country of Judea and a multitude from Jerusalem, including the Jewish religious elite, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, have been drawn here by the preaching and promise of one simply known as John. He is a prophet, the first prophet so recognized in 400 years, and like the prophets of old, he pronounces judgment and calls to task all that have violated the covenant with God. His message is simple but direct, and if taken seriously, a blessing to some and a cause of alarm to others. Repent, he says, for the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, change your ways, clean up your lives, and prepare yourselves for the long-awaited Messiah, for he is on the way. It is a message most unwelcome to the religious and political authorities for whom John cannot hide his contempt. Such dislike boils over when, spotting a group of Pharisees and Sadducees upon the shore, he calls them a brood of vipers before he goes on to attack what they believe to be their privileged status by declaring, and don't think you can escape the punishment by saying that Abraham is your ancestor. I tell you that God can take these rocks and make them descendants for Abraham. Still, his scorn is not reserved merely to the religious authorities, but extended to Herod Antipas, who ruled over the regions of Galilee and Perea. His criticism of the king was a direct result of Herod persuading his sister-in-law to leave her husband for him. Marriage to one's brother's wife while the brother was still living, was strictly forbidden by the law of Moses, as recorded in the book of Leviticus. This speaking of truth to power eventually cost John his life. Yet John is more than a prophet. He is a herald, a messenger, sent to proclaim a greater truth, and one for which the Jews had long awaited in anticipation, the coming of the Messiah foretold so long ago. He is well aware that his role, of his role, and in addition to preaching a baptism for the repentance and the forgiveness of sins, will proclaim, after me, he who comes is mightier than I. The thong of whose sandals I am now worthy to stoop down and untie. I will baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The one of whom he speaks the one who since the time of Moses all the prophets had predicted, pointed to, and waited for, has finally arrived. He has come from Nazareth of Galilee, a third-class village in second-class Galilee, a subtle indication suggesting that the Messiah is of humble origins. In effect, he is neither what the religious elite nor the people expect, and certainly is what they are ill-prepared to receive. Conventional wisdom held that the Messiah would be a warrior king, one who sent from God came to release the people and the religious leaders from the yoke of oppression imposed upon them by a series of conquering nations, which dated as far back as the Assyrians in 722 BC, and found its most recent expression when the Romans began to occupy this area by conquering Jerusalem in 63 BC. The task of the Messiah was not only to avenge years of domination, hostility, subjugation, and cruelty, but to restore the fortunes and greatness of Israel that it had not known since the time of King David, almost a thousand years previous. Contrary to what they believed, Jesus is going to proclaim that the Messiah they so anticipate is none of these things. The mission all begins on this one small stretch of river where Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens open and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, with thee I am well pleased. What we see happening is something most astonishing. 
In Mark's account, Jesus alone experiences the heavens torn asunder and the Spirit descending. And he alone hears the extraordinary, life-changing words proclaimed by none other than God himself. In short, it is a very personal experience, one that harkens back to the figures of the Old Testament whom God spoke to directly. People like Abraham and Moses and all of the prophets. Once God spoke to them, once they had an encounter with the Almighty, they were never the same. Such is the case with Jesus. As I have said so many times in the past, that the human Jesus had to grow into his divinity. By this I mean that although Jesus was certainly divine since the time of his birth, his power to perform miracles, physical healings, and raise the dead are not actualized until God's Spirit descends upon him. Before this moment, we hear nothing of Jesus' activities, neither of the battles of the forces with evil, the encounters with Satan, and the demons he will exorcise, nor his work among the marginalized. In fact, there are only two occasions that we hear of Jesus before his public ministry. The first, when he was born, and shortly thereafter. And second, when he is 12 years old, and he and his family attend the Passover celebration in Jerusalem. Apart from these two instances, we have no information on Jesus until now. This moment is transformative. The latent power that had always, always resided within the physical body of this very human man was now initiated by God's Holy Spirit. That very Spirit that moved over the face of the waters at the time of creation now signals that God has begun remaking the sin-filled cre sin creation, not through a warrior king, but through a man who will walk among us fully human, yet fully divine. It is this divine presence that is so remarkable. For I know of no other occasion in the ancient world where any God, anywhere, comes to the aid of his people to ease their suffering. In contrast, this is exactly what Jesus does. Such a journey from heaven to earth is all the more astonishing when we remember that according to the Jewish belief at the time, there is not one, but seven heavens, the last of which contains, among other things, the ministering angels and the throne of glory upon which is enthroned God himself. Consequently, God's love for us is such that he leaves the highest realm of heaven to walk among us and willingly take on our sin so that he can guarantee our salvation. Or, as one early church theologian, Athanasius of Alexandria, once observed, God became man that man might become God. God's active involvement in our lives begins with the baptism of Jesus, which is in many ways a preview of his entire ministry. Here, anointed through baptism by the Holy Spirit, Jesus fully realizes his divine potential, which has rested dormant until this time, this place, and this moment, when God has so decreed that the long-awaited Messiah has arrived. Yet he will be the Messiah people, he will not be the Messiah people expect. He will not act as the Messiah should act according to how they understand it. Rather, he will be one who stands knee deep in the Jordan, in solidarity with the sinners that he has come to save from their sin. He will not save us from the heights of heaven merely reaching down to us, far removed from the messiness of life, the sorrow, the tragedy, 
the hurt, the pain, the illness, the death. Rather, he will be present walking with us. God walking with us. Who in a very real way gets down in the water with us, stands shoulder to shoulder with us, and saves us by becoming one of us. When I was a child, I remember a friend of mine telling me of the training his brother had to go through to become a lifeguard at our town's local community pool. One of the things I remember him saying is that if you ever saw anyone having difficulty in the water, I should not go in after them, but throw them a life preserver, some type of flotation device, or try to reach them with a pole or a rope. Going into the water with them was only to be used as a last resort. The reason being that drowning people tend to drown their saviors. An individual who was going down for the third time becomes desperate, panics, and will climb on top of anything or anyone in order to get out of the water, even the person attempting to help them. In many ways, this could serve as a parable for today's gospel. Jesus has come to save us from ourselves, to save us for God and for God's coming reign. But he will not save us from the safety of the riverbank. Rather, he will wade into the water with us, risking not only the swirling currents around us, but his own safety, knowing that as a perishing people, we tend to destroy those who have come to save us. Despite the danger and because of the danger, the danger to our souls, he gets into the water with us. In his baptism, we see the lengths God will go in order to secure our salvation. Looking ahead at this Lenten season as it unfolds, we know that this story ends not in the refreshing water of some distant river, but upon the roughly hewn wood of the cross. Here the God who left the highest of heavens will be crucified by the very ones that he has come to save. Yet God will be victorious. He will not be bound by the chains of death. He will triumph over the grave, and in doing so, offer us a most assuring promise. Because I live, says the Lord, you will live also. And for that great and unwarranted gift, let the people answer and say, Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is the battle hymn of the Protestant Reformation. A mighty fortress is our God, hymn number 118.
place today, to face the joys and the challenges that this week will surely bring. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and truly, truly give you peace. This day and all the days of your lives, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.